Hello, my, my name is Thomas Durkin, so I'm an assistant professor at the Montreal Neurological Institute. I'm also associate director of the Neuro's Early Drug Discovery Unit. So I'm happy to be here to talk about some of the work ongoing within the group and particularly how we're using uh, induced pluripotent stem cells to model disorders of the brain. And one of the reasons for this is when we actually look at uh, diseases of the brain, such as Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, even uh, ALS versus cancer, like when it comes to cancer, there's been a huge kind of, uh, I guess, a lot of clinical therapies hitting the clinic over the last kind of two, three decades. And one of the main reasons for this is access to the cells themselves. So when patients get these cancers, you can pretty much get the cells, you can grow them on a dish, and you can really deeply phenotype them. But when it comes to disorders of the brain, we actually have a big problem with accessibility. And one of the reasons for this is the brain is actually what you're born with, it kind of tends to be what you have. So you can't really go in and take a ready supply of neurons from a person each time. And also, when it comes to the diseases itself, like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, oftentimes these are the cells that are actually lost. So the ones we want to work with that have the disease are actually the ones that are lost. So it's a disease of loss. So ideally, to really understand this disease, we'd have loved to have human neurons on our dish for many decades to really get to the kind of nuanced understanding of what's going on. But in reality, we've been stuck with using these immortalized uh, cancer cell lines, like HeLa cells, E2OS cells, and they've really helped us understand the biology of these genes that are affected within these CNS disorders, but these cells are not really exactly a neuron themselves. So we asked, like uh, and us and many others we asked, could we generate specific cell types from patients to test new drugs? So could we actually generate neurons from a specific cell type? And the answer is yes. And stem cells actually gave they actually make the idea of creating these human models possible. And so this is where it all really begins for our group, and actually many groups working in the stem cell field is actually with these induced pluripotent stem cells, or iPSCs. And so this all comes from the work from Dr. Yamanaka, which started back in 2006, and we actually have been applying this in our group for about the past three, four years, or when patients enter within the clinics, either with Parkinson's, ALS, or other kind of movement disorders, we're able to collect the blood from them, and then with the Yamanaka factors, we can then reprogram it into an iPSC itself, shown here. And so, since we started making these iPSCs, uh, we've actually really, we've always wanted to work with high-quality iPSCs, which has led us to actually implement a very rigorous QC process for doing it, led by Dr. Carol Chen and uh, Nargis Abtian, really focused on four main areas. So how well the cells would grow. So do we have them in the optimal media and growth conditions and even cell density? Uh, are the cells stable? So is the genome stable? Do they have the right number of chromosomes? And do they actually have an absence of any stability mutations that might confer a growth advantage? And then the two main parts of it is pluripotency and differentiation potential. Will they actually grow and develop into the cell types that we want? So since we started these efforts, we've actually built a catalog of close to 80 IPS lines covering three main areas. So we have about 18 healthy controls across uh, both sexes, age groups, even uh, the source of the cells from either a PBMC versus a fibroblast. Uh, and one of the main areas is Parkinson's disease. So we have a number of patient lines or CRISPR edited lines. So for the CRISPR iPSCs, we've actually gone and actually knocked out a number of genes that would actually have high relevance to the disease, or if we didn't have the mutations within our patient cohort, so there might have been rare mutations, mm -hmm. we've been able to use CRISPR to actually edit in these mutations. And we've been able to replicate a lot of these efforts on the ALS side. So for many of the common monogenic forms, such as SOD1 or CNR72, we've been able to either get patient lines and make them into iPSCs, or to actually edit in or correct some of these mutations. And so, We've had about 80 internal lines, and we've also built in and kind of another 60 uh, external lines. So these are lines that we've just gone through the kindness of uh, asking collaborators through uh, repositories to actually build it up even further to where we now have close to 60 cell lines. And so this has really led us to allowed us to do a lot of different work with these stem cells themselves. And so for those that are people that might be interested in getting the iPSCs from our group, you can then access them through our MNI uh, CBIG repository. And uh, the person in charge of that that liaises with our group is uh, Maddie. So I'm happy to, if anyone is interested after this talk and would like to know more, I'm happy to kind of 
connect you with Maddie and find out the details about accessing any line listed here. So we have these stem cells, but in reality what we want to do is the, uh, the IPSC is like the window into what we want to do next. And one of the areas we want to go to is actually making 2D neurons for different assays and discovery-based purposes. And so we actually use them for three main disease areas. So one is Parkinson's disease, where the, the relevant cell type affected here is dopaminergic neurons. Uh, when it comes to ALS, the two main dis disease types that we work with are motor neurons, astrocytes, and now more recently microglia. And then when it comes to developmental disorders, so uh, intellectual disabilities or autism spectrum disorders, we've been generating a lot of cortical neurons and oligodendrocytes for working and kind of doing discovery work for here. But for the purposes of this talk and for time, I'm really just going to focus on the Parkinson's side and our work with the dopaminergic neurons. But if anyone wants to know more, I'm happy to talk later on. So when it comes to Parkinson's disease, it's actually the second most common neurodegenerative disease both worldwide and in Canada. Uh, has a prevalence of about 1.6 per 100 individuals, and it is a disease of aging. So as individuals start to get older, you actually see a much more higher prevalence, uh, close to 3.5 per 100 in people over the age of 80. Uh, symptoms include, so these are the motor symptoms. You can have a tremor, you can have a slowness in movement, so a bradykinesia, you can muscle rigidity gait, and you do actually have a cohort of symptoms that actually arise before you get the motor symptoms. So you can often get uh, hallucinations, depression, anxiety, a diminished sense of smell. And actually one of the most common uh, features or symptoms of a patient that might actually develop uh, Parkinson's in later life is actually REM sleep disorder or disruptive sleep pattern itself. And so there are two main hallmarks of Parkinson's itself. So one is actually a loss of dopamine. And so it's really only once about 50 to 70% of dopaminergic neurons have been lost that you actually start to see a manifestation in the motor symptoms themselves. And this is just a section through both a healthy individual, uh, obviously a, a person who had been a healthy individual, and a person who had Parkinson's disease. And you can see here this kind of pigmented area here, the substantia nigra. Uh, these are where the dopaminergic neurons would reside and where they would have neuromelanin. And here you would actually see is when the patient has advanced Parkinson's, these neurons have been lost, and you actually see a decrease in the coloration and the pigmentation itself. A second hallmark of Parkinson's is actually the development of insoluble inclusions termed Lewy bodies. And so just uh, you can see here with the arrows, you can see these insoluble clumps formed in the neuron. And the primary component of these is actually alpha-synuclein, which I'm going to actually kind of spend a lot more of the talk actually talking about. And there's other components, including ubiquitin and also lipid components, which make up these Lewy bodies. So two hallmarks of Parkinson's are loss of dopaminergic neurons and the presence of Lewy bodies. And so we really wanted to kind of understand the effect of synuclein within kind of the context of maybe Parkinson's using human neurons, uh, so which actually led us to actually uh, adopt protocols in the field from the group of uh, Richard Wade Martin at Oxford and also Lawrence Studer's group, where this is actually the protocol of how we would go from uh, IPSC into a kind of embryoid body, and then we would start to mature the neuron over time into an early dopaminergic neuron, and then gradually into a mature dopaminergic neuron, which, as we show here, these are just images from the neurons as they mature from one week across to six weeks. And we use tyrosine hydroxylase or TH in green to then mark the presence of these dopaminergic neurons as TH is a dopaminergic marker. And if anyone wants to learn more about these protocols, we've listed them here on Zenodo. So we actually, all our protocols for how we make these dopaminergic motor neurons, we actually put them all online so that anyone can see how we do it. So we knew we had these dopaminergic neurons, but we wanted to actually do something relevant in terms of studying synuclein. So we actually started work, and this is led by Dr. Wen Lau in the group, where we actually took a, a GST alpha synuclein, and we actually were able to express several mix of the protein on any given purification. So this is actually showing what the GST alpha synuclein look like here on the left here. And then we also then have it after cleavage. So when you remove the GST tag, we're able to then clean it up and actually purify it in much uh, pure quantities on our acta. And then we're able to then uh, aggregate it and let it form these what we call preformed fibrils. And so this actually, if you look at the top image here, this is actually what a PFF would look like or a fibril would look like before sonication. So before you actually introduce stress to break it down. 
But when you actually sonicate it, which is what we actually do for our assays, to make them into much smaller components, then they're around between 40 to 80 nanometers in size. And then this is what we would then have that we would use for our assays. And so this is actually kind of work pioneered by both uh, Dr. Chen Shui Quan and uh, Dr. Wolfgang Reins in terms of taking these fibrils and using them in a variety of different discovery assays. And so one of them has actually been focused on where we would just take these aggregates, we would uh, form the aggregates, sonicate them, and we would actually just label them with a fluorescent dye, so Alexa 488. You would just add it into the media, the, the neurons readily take them up, or even neuronal progenitors. Uh, they get taken up, and then using a high content or automated system, we could now vis image, visualize, and then quantify the rate of uptake within these neurons themselves. Uh, you can even confirm the presence of these uh, fibrils within the neurons themselves by staining for uh, alpha synuclein, and then you can even quantify it. So if you actually leave it for a different hours, so if you incubate it either for 24, 48, or 72 hours, the longer the incubation and even the longer the concentration, you can really start to I guess, uh, propelled uptake much at faster rates. But our interest in this actually, so we do have assays going on in the lab, but the real interest in this actually came because we wanted to not just look at how well it got into the cell, but how well it would actually induce or template the formation of new aggregates. So we actually had two cell lines in the lab. We had a, a synuclein triplication line. So this is a line in which the synuclein gene, we actually have two extra copies of it, and it's from a part patient with Parkinson's. And then we have the isogenic control in which two of the alleles have then been removed. And this is all thanks to uh, Dr. Tzu Lukunin. So we have to say thank you to him and his group for these lines. And so once we got these lines, what we wanted to see is how well would fibrils actually be able to induce these new aggregates to form. And so this is work by uh, Chen Shui Han again and uh, Emmanuel Nguyen Renu. And what they did was once the fibrils got into the neurons themselves, we left it for two weeks. So we, these are two week neurons to start and then we matured them for two weeks to four weeks. And then we actually fixed and stained and says, do these fibrils, do they actually induce the formation of new aggregates. And this all comes from the idea that these synuclein aggregates are acting like a prion-like particle where they can template the formation of new aggregates. And indeed, actually, to our surprise, and actually, well, not really to our surprise, but much to our delight, we were able to actually really see the formation of these new seeds or new fibrils. And we could do this by staining for phosphorylated synuclein at S129 on synuclein. So this is a marker of kind of mature synuclein aggregates. So we could see as in the isogenic control line, we were able to see kind of little white dots indicative of the formation of new uh, synuclein. When we would actually just give it synuclein monomer, we didn't see the, these aggregates form. So it really appeared that it was really, we needed these toxic aggregates to be present. But when we actually did it in a triplication line, so we had almost two, three times the level of just regular synuclein in these neurons, then we actually saw a lot more templating of these aggregates and a lot more seeding. So you could really start to see these kind of white dots spread throughout the neuronal population. So uh, Chen Shui and Emmanuel, they were able to actually quantify this and even visualize it on the confocal. So here, this shows a kind of much higher kind of close-up of these neurons on a confocal, where you could actually see in the kind of second from the left, you can see the phosphorylated synuclein pattern within the neurons themselves. And the more fibrils that you would add uh, in the synuclein triplication would always go up, 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 so that by around two micromolar of fibrils, you would have to almost uh, the maximal amount of synuclein seeds that you would see. And same for monomeric, when you would add monomeric synuclein, you never really saw any really more uh, aggregates that would form. And so to really confirm that this was actually phosphorylated synuclein, uh, Chen Shui did this cool test where we actually stained the cells uh, with the different, uh, sorry, before we actually did the actual assay, we fixed the neurons and then we actually treated them with phosphatase to remove any phosphate on the actual neurons themselves. And when we did that, we were actually able to pretty much abrogate or remove any signal that was indicative of a phosphorylated synuclein. So it was really to confirm the specificity of the antibody and show that what we're seeing here in terms of a phosphorylated synuclein signal was really a phosphorylated synuclein. And so this kind of led us, so as we're still kind of working on the seeding assay to kind of understand the mechanism, at the same time, we also kind of started to work on this in 3D neuronal organoids. So we wanted to kind of look at it in a system that we felt it may be even more physiological than just flat neurons on a dish. And so 
people go, well, why would you work in 3D? And there's several reasons why we do this. One is that these uh, brain organoids, so this all kind of started probably around 2011, 2012, when Madeleine Lancaster started publishing her work on cerebral organoids. And then more recently after that, then there was work from uh, Joe and Monzel looking at uh, protocols to make these midbrain organoids. And the reason is they're very interconnected. So you have a lot of the different cell types that you would see within the brain. It's quite scalable, easy to maintain, and you've got a diversity in cell types. So in our group, we've done a number of single cell studies where we could actually show a combination of both dopaminergic neurons, radial glia, oligodendrocytes, even astrocytes, kind of very similar to what you would then see within the substantia nigra region of the brain or even just across different regions in the brain itself. And that's customizable. So we can make different types. And for our purposes, because we're studying Parkinson's, the main thing is to develop uh, midbrain organoids themselves. And so what we want to do is why would we want to actually have these organoids or mini brains? And what we want to do with it is twofold. From each patient, when we make these mini brains, we wanted to do two things. One wants to actually to see is what do they look like? One is to actually understand is within the actual mini brain or organoid itself, how did the neurons look like relative to other cell types? Is there kind of effects in the morphology itself? And then could we even apply optical imaging? So instead of like on the left where you would section through it and just look at a, a flat slice, how would it look like if we actually constructed the whole thing in 3D? So then we can understand how is each cell type or even how are different proteins within a 3D environment interacting with each other? And so this is where we leave it whole, but one of the other areas of interest is what happens if we just break it apart, let it form a kind of cellular jigsaw. And this is where and many of you will be aware of is the single cell sequencing work that's been going on from many groups, including our own. And so this is work that I'll talk a little bit about later on, where we can take these organoids, uh, dissociate them into single cell mixtures, and then we can then study them and understand what cell types are present. And is there specific proteins or is there specific organelles or markers in a defined cell population that might be kind of representative of a disease phenotype versus not? And so in addition to the 2D neurons that we've been doing across the 3D, uh, in addition to all the 2D neurons we've been doing across the disease areas, we've also been doing a lot of the work in 3D as well, and kind of trying to match the 2D with the 3D. So in terms of Parkinson's, we've been making the midbrain organoids to actually match it with the 2D dopaminergic neurons. On the ALS side, we've actually been, instead of making organoids, we've been making these kind of man-made uh, motospheres, where they're kind of motor neurons that we aggregate into 3D, and have been able to mix in different cell types, including astrocytes, to actually study ALS in a 3D context. And then finally, on the developmental side, we've been actually working with uh, protocols from uh, the Lancaster group, the PASCA group, and others to actually make these cerebral organoids uh, or forebrain organoids to then study the developmental pathways within these organoids themselves. So for us, the main organoid we're interested in is the midbrain organoid for studying Parkinson's disease. And this just gives you a kind of uh, schematic of what the process would look like, where we actually start with the human IPSC on the left. We dissociate it into a kind of single cell mixture, and then we aggregate it to form a uniform embryoid body, or as best we can to be uniform, in a low attachment U bottom dish. Then we actually, after about seven days, we actually then transfer them into matrigel embed them for another few days, and then we actually transfer them over into six well dishes, where we would then shake them and mature them with a variety of chemical factors that allow the neurons to mature and develop over time. And so we can grow them anywhere from up to 30 days of maturation up to the longest we've gone is up to 12 to 14 months. And this really all depends on how long and how, how well you want to mature them for. And so we always really need a combination of chemical and physical factors for doing this. So you always would have an orbital shaker in the incubator to grow these at constant shaking over the time you're doing it. And so this is really work pioneered by uh, Dr. Nguyen V. Mohammed. And the work I'm going to talk about afterward is really a project that she's developed and that you can see it online if you want as well at BioArca. Uh, that's coming in short. And then it's actually uh, the other people involved with this are uh, Megna Mature, Paula Lapine, and uh, Julianne Sirwa who have really been helped kind of pioneering a lot of the work. So we had the questions, or when we started seeing the work in terms of organizers, 
it seemed great for studying neurodevelopmental disorders, but could we use organoids to kind of model PD in a dish? Not just the way you would with a 2D neuron, but could it actually give you more features or could it be more representative of what's going on with the disease? And we kind of asked four main questions. So one was, we knew in the disease itself, you would, in the substantia and liger, you would have neuromelanin granules that would form. You would have the presence of the phosphorylated synuclein pathology. You would have the presence of a legomeric synuclein. And you would get a decrease in dopaminergic neurons as they die off. But in rodent models, you don't really see that. You don't really see the presence of neuromelanin granules within a rodent model. Uh, phosphorylated pathology is not really observed by itself. You have to really force it. There are certain models that you can over long term, and you might even have to just give it fibrils to really induce it, and similar to what you would have with uh, oligomers. And so we had these four questions. Could we actually see these four characteristics with a midbrain organoid model? So what we did was we actually started with three different lines. We had the synuclein triplication line, which I mentioned earlier. We had its isogenic control, where we had uh, two of the alleles were knocked out. So it was either isogenic triplication. And then a line which I'll talk about on the future slide is actually we had a synuclein knockout. So all the alleles had been knocked out. And so we, we went through the midbrain organoid protocol, and then we made different batches of these organoids. And this just shows you here uh, in the middle here just what they would look like. And we would do size and profiles as we matured them from 60 to 100 days. The isogenic always seemed to be a little larger. And we're not sure why. It's still something we're investigating, whether it's either a developmental defect or maybe it's due to neuronal loss, but it's something we are investigating. Uh, we did also detect the presence of neuromelanin granules. So if you did fontanel methane staining, so what we would do is we would take an organoid at 45 days, add in dopamine, and leave it for about seven days, then we would fix stain and then section. We would then actually be able to see these kind of little black punctates throughout the organoid section itself. And this is actually due to kind of the silver stain within the fontanel methane that you could then visualize and quantify the presence of these neuromelanin granules. The other question is, I guess, if we saw the presence of neuromelanin granules, was this indicative of dopaminergic neurons being present? And we assumed so, but we needed to confirm it, which is why we stained for the dopaminergic marker tyrosine hydroxylase again. And this just shows a section through a 60-day-old organoid showing that we have a lot of these TH-positive neurons uh, corresponding with MAP2 staining for neurons. So we do have TH-positive neurons throughout, and it tends to be primarily around the exterior of the organoid itself, but it was still pretty good to see this amount of TH-positive neurons present. Interestingly, we also did some Western blocks to quantify the TH levels, and so it did appear that we actually did start to see a slight decrease in the level of TH uh, levels after about 60 days within our triplication line, which may be indicative of these neurons being lost, or it may just simply be a defect in how well they form within the triplication itself. So that's something we need to really understand and look at a bit deeper. Because when you actually just look at the number of uh, neurons present, it didn't seem to be changed that much within the triplication versus isogenic. So the, the next thing we wanted to see is, so we knew we could get these midbrain organoids to form, but our question was, what happens if we have elevated synuclein like you would see within a Parkinson's patient? And so we did Western blocks of these 100-day-old organoids uh, with two different synuclein antibodies, just to really confirm that we had elevated synuclein levels, and we did. And we had a triplication mutation present. We had a lot more synuclein there. With the isogenic control, the levels really decreased, and with the knockout, it was abrogated, so it was barely detectable. Uh, this is also being confirmed with qPCR as well, and all the validation with the line has been confirmed to really show that these mutations are where they are and what they say they are. We then actually did some IHC, uh, or sorry, IF uh, staining on the actual sections from the organoids, so the triplication, the isogenic, or the knockout, and we're able to show that we did see an increased synuclein level responding pretty well to what we would see in amino blotting. Uh, we could uh, quantify this and show that the levels of synuclein are much higher within the section from a triplication organoid and that levels within a knockout were negligible. And when we actually did a close-up of what it would look like, we could actually see that it would appear to correspond to both astrocytes and neurons. And so the, here you can see these kind of arrows pointing to kind of red punctate for the synuclein signal. 
And so you could start to see it within some MAP2 positive neurons or even in some S100 beta positive astrocytes. And this is something I'm going to touch on towards the end as well. So we knew we had a lot of synuclein, but what we didn't know is, was the synuclein aggregating? So we decided to do two approaches to see what was going on. One was we actually did a synuclein proximal ligation assay, where we actually wanted to see is, could we detect the oligomers or the earliest form of aggregated synuclein in these actual sections themselves? And so this just kind of outlines the protocol here, and if you want to know more of how this works, uh, the protocol is here from uh, Dr. Rosalind Roberts. So we took a section, uh, thankfully, this is all thanks to Dr. Jason Karmachidani, who is the director of the MNI's repository. He had patients with a uh, dementia with Lewy body, and he had sections of substantia nigra. So we were able to actually optimize and develop the protocol within the kind of this, these patient samples. And we could actually show that when we actually had the synuclein stain here, it was actually able to correspond to the PLA signal here, confirming the presence of these oligomers. And the oligomers appear to also co-localize with phosphorylated synuclein. So it appeared that we actually had two different types of synuclein present within our patient, both uh, the oligomeric form and the phosphorylated form. And so then we were like, okay, the system looks like it works. So what happens if we actually test it with organoids themselves? And so when we did the organoids, we had sections from both the triplication, the isogenic, and the knockout. We were able to actually see quite a lot of the oligomeric synuclein present within the triplication. But when it came to the knockout or even the isogenic, the levels are much, much lower, indicating here with all these arrows here for the kind of, I guess, magenta or blue section here. And then when you looked at the synuclein levels, it was much lower. And then when you looked at phosphorylated synuclein, we actually were able to see a little bit in the triplication, but it was then negligible then throughout. So we knew we had a oligomeric synuclein, and it appeared we also had phosphorylated synuclein within our samples. So we took a little bit of a closer dive into the phosphorylated synuclein in the organoids. And so we actually first did immunoblotting. So we actually, these are aged organoids. So these are all at 100 days. And we could see when we stained for phosphorylated synuclein, we could actually readily detect it within our synuclein triplication line. Uh, when we did look at the isogenic or the SNCA knockout, the levels are pretty much either negligible or not there. But it wasn't like it was phosphorylated synuclein or it was widespread. It was actually in a very sub kind of subpopulations of cells. You had to sometimes often look for it and the levels were low in many of the different organoids. So this is actually showing you a close-up of what the phosphorylated synuclein aggregates would look like and where they would be within an actual full organoid itself. And then here's a close-up of showing it both in the neurons and in the astrocyte itself. So kind of matching with the synuclein staining we showed earlier, you could see quite a lot of the phosphorylated synuclein staining matching both with the GFAP for astrocytes or MAP2 for neurons themselves. So this is good. We were encouraged that we then have these kind of a patient organoid, elevated synuclein. A lot more synuclein then seemed to lead to aggregated uh, ligomeric synuclein and also the presence of these phosphorylated aggregates. Uh, but it didn't appear to be widespread, which is why kind of towards the end of it, we decided to see what would happen if we actually dissociated these organoids and actually did a kind of flow cytometric profiling of them as well. Could we detect and see where they would be within the different cell types? So that's actually where uh, Julianne and V came in. They actually took the organoids, they broke them apart, and they actually kind of ran them through a variety of different steps where we could get them into a single cell mix, where we could then run them through a flow cytometer. And then from here, we were able to then take the raw data and actually then gate it, and actually look for the presence of viability, and then we could gate it and look for the presence of cells with phosphorylated synuclein itself. And so what you can see here is when you actually have the synuclein triplication, the dissociated organoid, you have nearly 0.43% of the cells would actually have a phosphorylated signal, and this is almost negligible when it came to the isogenic or the knockout, which is actually consistent with what we were seeing with the kind of staining and even the blots itself. Um, we also then wanted to see is how would it then compare if we started to break the cell types into two different populations. So we either did CD56 positive, CD24 positive cells, uh, representative of neurons, or you would do CD56 negative, CD24 negative, representative of astrocytes. 
and it seemed that the results seemed to correspond quite well to what we were seeing in this section, is that these aggregates were primarily in the neurons, but you also did see them, or at least some of them, within the astrocyte or the glial population themselves. And it seemed to be almost absent when we looked at the knockout or the isogenic control. And these two populations are just shown here in the kind of right bottom. So we took this one step further and actually said, well, what would happen if we aged them even more? So, so far, all the data we've shown is with 100-day-old organoids. But what would happen if they were actually a little older, like 170 days old? And it was actually quite exciting to see is that when we actually looked at the phosphorylated synuclein levels shown here in V, we actually saw quite an increase, or at least a bit more phosphorylated synuclein signal relative to what you would see at 100 days. And we were even able to kind of pinpoint the cells both within the synuclein population would actually, every cell in the synuclein population seemed to correspond to a phosphorylated synuclein cell here as well, indicating that it was really only in the synuclein overexpressing cells that you were actually getting this phosphorylated synuclein signal. So in conclusion, for this part, it does appear that the midbrain organoid does actually have a lot of the characteristics you would like to model PD in a dish, although there still are some caveats, and I'll get to them in a sec. So you do have the presence of neuromelanin granules that form, and you can we did dopamine to induce it, but you can even just let them age and mature gradually over six to eight months, and even see granules form by themselves. You can even see the presence of the pathology, so both oligomeric synuclein and phosphorylated synuclein pathology which you wouldn't see otherwise. And we do appear that we might have a decrease in dopaminergic neuron, but this is still a bit controversial, yet we don't know if that's due to actually like a loss of neurons or maybe it's a developmental defect. <coughs> so now we're kind of ready to take the next step. So there are kind of certain ways we're kind of going with this. Uh, so, so far, the study we've shown is uh, it's been submitted, and then we're going to finalize it now, but we're always looking to the next steps. So one is obviously to see what happens with different patient lines. So we are starting to look at different synuclein mutant lines, uh, other mutant lines we have with other diseases, or with other genes, and even some of the sporadic PD lines as well to start to model the development of these aggregates and even to look at other processes as well. But we're also looking to see is can we optimize the actual organoid development itself. And so this is where we've actually kind of partnered with two companies. One is Inuvio and one is Embrain Bio to actually kind of develop a process that we now have ongoing in-house to make these at a much higher scale and also in a more robust and reproducible manner. And so this is where we actually, they call, they're called EB disks. So you can actually make organoids uh, at either a level of 150, 300, or 800 organoids that can then be incubated into these bioreactors. And this just shows them here, where you could actually let them grow at much higher scale than when we have them in the six well dishes as it was done with our prior study. And so by having the ability to scale up and have them more robust, we can actually then actually start to really see what might actually be going on in a more standardized manner. And to give you an idea of the standardization, this actually just shows you what a bioreactor organoid would look like versus a six-well organoid. So in a six-well organoid, you have a lot of rosettes. But when you actually have a bioreactor organoid, they actually tend to be a lot more uniform. The cells tend to be spread out. And we actually appear that it may be that you have decreased necrosis. So this is ongoing work. And this is really work that uh, has been pioneered by uh, Dr. Nguyen V. Mohammed, who always wondered could we make these organoids a little bit better or a little bit more automated and standardized to what we would already be working with? So this is something that she's working on at the moment, and I think it will be a case of watch this space to see what comes next from this. And so I'm going to leave it here. So this is just kind of gives you a kind of snapshot into the work we have going on in the team. So uh, this is a group that started back probably 2015, led by uh, Dr. Ed Fawn and myself. Uh, we started with three people. We're now close to 40 people covering our gambit of disease area, uh, a gambit of technological areas from CRISPR editing to automation to IPS maintenance. And so this just this shows all the various people that work within the group now today. And this just shows you all the funding agents we have or the people that we work with in terms of helping with this project, including uh, CPDM and the Van Berken Foundation. And so if anyone wants to know more, learn anything about the group, we have it all on our website here. So the website link is there. We have our QR code here, and you can actually then 
see all our protocols. You can see any recent publications from the group, and you can even find the contact details on all the different members if you just simply just want to kind of know who's who and want to reach out to talk to someone about a given topic or something. So I will leave it there, and if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them then.